Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, welcome to another PPS event at the Clinton Street Theater. <laughs> cool. Um, if this is your first meeting uh, with the Portland Psychedelic Society, welcome. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization that is uh, dedicated to the understanding and legitimization of psychedelic medicines and their various uses to help us heal. Uh, we're a community that gathers to learn, to heal, to grow, to support each other. So I just want to make sure that you know every single one of you feels that that you know we're here to support each other and uh, further our, our own collective education on these subjects. Um, that being said, um, this is not a place to, to buy or sell drugs. Um, Portland's cool, but it's not that cool yet. <laughs> um, my name is Evan. I'm a board member with the Portland Psychedelic Society, and I'm originally from Illinois, uh, which is a pretty conservative state, at least it was where I grew up, and most of the Midwest as well. And um, I'm extremely grateful for, uh, for Ian and for your perspective uh, on, on things because um, perspectives from different people in the community is the key to unlock progress within this, this field uh, of psychedelics, you know, to erase this stigma, to further the acceptance of people finding the, you know, um, the modality to heal, however it may apply to them. And um, Ian, he, uh, you're, he's an incredible man, and uh, I'm going to pass the microphone off to you, and you can um, share your beautiful story with us. So thank you. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Yeah. Round of applause. <laughs> All right. Um, so I'm Ian Stout. I am a filmmaker. Um, I am a psychonaut in the sense that um, I have taken psychedelics in the past, and I've taken psilocybin. Yeah. And I've taken them recently as well um, for much, uh, very differing reasons. So um, we'll kind of jump back and forth between them. Um, PTSD is uh, a, pretty, a pretty big topic these days. MDMA assisted therapy to aid with PTSD is the subject matter of the film. And um, we look to get in depth uh, and show at least three people's stories um, from the perspective of the therapist and of the therapist team. And we're going to be a fly on the wall as these uh, three individuals go through, um, uh, you know, before. We're going to hang out with them before they, they even embark on their mission. Um, we're going to go through the uh, three MDMA treatments and um, some of the uh, in-between sessions, talk sessions that, that need to be couched in that. And then um, we'll be checking up with them at least one year later. And depending on when the film would be released, um, we'll, we'll check in with them at the last possible second uh, so you can kind of see how they're doing. Um, my own journey, uh, I, well, uh, let's just, we're gonna, we're gonna popcorn back and forth, jump around the timeline. Um, and uh, we can, let's just jump straight into Iraq. Um, a lot of it over there was boredom, uh, surrounded by even more boredom. And that wasn't what I was expecting when I headed over there. Um, but I think when it gets crazy is when the boredom is broken up by one of those extraordinary days that you'll obviously never forget because the shit hit the fan. And um, I, I think one of the, the most impactful days for me was um, we were in Baghdad. Uh, we were right behind Third ID, which had basically taken over Baghdad, captured the airport, and um, locked it down and set up some somewhat of a green zone. Uh, and we were the push right behind them to hold down the Baghdad, basically occupy Baghdad and and um, keep the mission going. Whatever the mission was, I still haven't figured it out, 
but um, keep the mission going was, was the goal. And um, uh, so there we were holding down the fort. Um, I drove logistical package. I was the lead gun truck, uh, the driver of the lead gun truck, protecting all the goods that we would pick up at the airport, bring back to Baghdad, to our base, distribute accordingly. And um, a very unique thing happened when uh, it was probably 11 o'clock at night and uh, we heard anti-aircraft guns going off. And then we heard the West Gate under attack. And then we heard the East Gate under attack. And then we heard from the North and the South like systematically every single outpost in Baghdad was under attack all at the exact same time. And we were all just reeling, trying to figure out how in the hell they orchestrated such a, a synchronized push against everyone that was basically occupying Baghdad. Um, I've never heard so many rounds go off in a short period of time. And um, first thing we did was jump on the radio. Nobody knew what the hell was going on. The next thing we were forced to basically set up a 360 perimeter inside of our uh, particular part of the base. So you've got the outer gates, another inner gate to your compound, and then even like an inner circle around your area. So we all grabbed our weapons, ran out, you know, got about 50 feet to my, or 50 feet or 50 yards to my left and right. We hit the ground and we basically wait for the inevitable attack. Um, and there's, I can't even describe the kind of thoughts that are going through your head when you know that you're going to be in a firefight, you hear it happening, you know it, eventually it's going to break through the line and hit you, and you're pretty sure at the size and the sound of what's coming in that you're not going to be going to make it out alive. You might put up a good fight, but you're pretty, I was convinced um, that was it. Uh, and then to be in that state for about two hours, waiting, getting on the radio. Do we know what's going on? No. Do we know who they've taken over yet? No. Uh, back and forth, back and forth. Um, the anxiety just builds and builds and builds and builds. And, and then somewhere, somebody finally gets the word back down the line to us that not only is our compound not under attack, not only is the next uh, wave out under attack, not under attack. Um, absolutely nobody in Baghdad is under attack. And we're all like, well, what the fuck? What is up with all, like literally every anti-aircraft weapon is, I've never, it was like the 4th of July times 10 out there. Um, and it turns out that um, a different, a completely different unit somewhere had killed Uday and Kuse, the two sons. And um, to celebrate uh, weddings or the massacre of a maniac, everyone fires their guns in the air in celebration. And they will do this for about three or four hours straight. Um, and somehow, some way, communication was broken and nobody told us. So that was about two and a half hours of, yep, probably going to die, uh, that maybe could have been avoided had somebody actually given us the info. Um, and then you realize it's okay, and you go back to the boredom. And weeks go by, um, and um, nothing much happens, and then uh, you're, you're at an outpost. I was at an outpost waiting to see, um, we're, we're, we're basically getting um, paper, like, a bunch of paper, like hundreds and hundreds of pounds of paper to bring back to base so that uh, we could continue doing the mission because you have no idea the amount of paperwork that goes into making the military happen. It's a lot. I probably signed my name 670 times, not even joking, before we even left to go to theater. So we needed more paper. And we were at this, uh, we were at, we were basically on guard waiting for the people inside to negotiate the, the getting of the paper, and what was supposed to be an hour and a half turned into four hours, turned into six hours. It's about uh, 125 degrees out. You're in full battle rattle. You're sweating. You're drink you've drank all your water. You're tired. You know, you're holding the perimeter. You're waiting. 
And um, eventually, they come out with a paper, you load up the truck, and in that tiny, tiny moment where they say, pack up, let's go, and every single person who has been vigilant on guard turns and starts loading into the truck is exactly when they attacked. Two shots fired. Um, I'm already in the driver's seat. I reach for my M16, and then my entire world blows up around me. Uh, IED had been thrown, rolled underneath the truck, exploded, um, and uh, my instant dying thought was, oh wow, that's it? I don't even get to fight back? Like, that's it, I'm done. And then about a half a second goes by and you realize that's not it. And then two seconds go by and you realize, you know, the, the, the sound starts to come back in. Um, the dust that is kind of kicked up everywhere uh, is just, I mean, it's, it rains down for a good 30 seconds and then it starts to settle. And um, you, you jump back out, you set up your perimeter, you see who's attacking who. Um, it was just a drive-by. Whoever attacked us took off. Um, and so we all piled back in the truck, drove out of there like a bat out of hell. And um, very interesting to have both ends of the spectrum. Two and a half hours of sitting there waiting to die and a split second where your brain is convinced you are dead. Um, and then almost the rest of my tour was boredom, followed by one more IED attack which uh, we were driving at that point, and when it went off, it knocked me unconscious, and I woke up to my lieutenant punching me in the arm to wake me back up. And uh, this, is, this is, you can finally understand the state of where you're at. When you come back to, and you see the spiderwebbed windshield, and you see the dust settling, and you can hear your ears ringing, and you just start laughing, because you know, you've made it yet again, against all odds. Um, I'm laughing, he's yelling at me to pull over. I'm basically driving down the road, knocked unconscious. Uh, you know, makes, makes everybody else in the truck more nervous. Um, I, was, I was having a nap. Um, so, yeah, uh, and then it was um, basically biding our time until, until we finally were out of theater. Um, and then, you know, you kinda, you, you start to integrate back into society. Um, society doesn't make any sense when you get back. Um, ask any veteran, uh, it's, it's very jarring how society feels, it just feels off. Something's not right with it. Um, after further inspection, you find out that, yeah, plenty of it uh, is, that's correct. There is stuff that's not right with it. And we, we're all working on those things. And, um, and, the, uh, and the rest of it is just your brain and how it's not ready to be a normal human being again. Um, so I'm going to jump into uh, one of my favorite monologues. Uh, I've been doing, um, so I'm a filmmaker, I also enjoy a lot of theater, and um, I've had the privilege of seeing a lot of Shakespeare this year. Um, Macbeth, in particular, is, is a heck of an interesting tale if you've never witnessed it. And um, our main guy is, uh, after, after probably the fourth or fifth kind of time through, through the, um, through the work, I, I started to, I, I didn't realize why I got the guy so much until later on. I mean, he's, he makes all sorts of awful decisions and he ends up weighing in over his head and he ends up having, he, he murders some of his friends, um, his wife's kind of whispering in his ear to do all these terrible, nasty things. Um, but deep, uh, he's a soldier, um, he's one of the most revered soldiers in his in his, um, you know, in his battalion for his country at the time in Scotland, uh, but he comes, he he comes to a place where the PTSD from war and the PTSD from having made bad decisions and trying to quickly take power to make the change that he wants to see in the world, um, you know, backfires. And um, uh, I think there's there's some there's some good cautionary tales in there, but uh, to not to not labor this too much, let's just jump into a, a couple key lines from the monologue because I feel like it sums up uh, PTSD quite nicely. Um, let's see here. But let the frame of things disjoint, both the worlds, su uh, both the worlds suffer. Ere we will eat our meal in fear and sleep. In the affliction of these terrible dreams, they shake us nightly better be with the dead, whom we, to gain our peace, have sent to peace. 
than on the torture of the mind to lie in restless ecstasy. Oh, full of scorpions is my mind, dear wife. I'm jumping a little further in the monologue. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in the, the petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time and all our yesterdays have light, uh, lighted fools. The way to dusty death, out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his, uh, his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. That sums up PTSD for me pretty good. Kind of that. <sighs> Scorpions in the mind. Um, so yeah, at this point, I am back in society and uh, nightmares persist for off and on for about five years. Um, the, I think two things are important to take note of. One, I did not want to seek help through the VA or through any other means um, because for one, I didn't want the stigma of being someone who had PTSD. Uh, societally and personally, we both have this feeling that if you have PTSD, you are in some ways broken and untrustworthy and not okay, and it's better not to let the world know that you're not okay, especially if you wanna go get a job or do anything of, of anything in the professional world. And so I didn't want the stigma. Uh, and the second thing was um, I didn't want to just go take a bunch of drugs that would numb me out and make me even more not me than I already was because uh, I saw that happening to a lot of my friends who did go the, uh, the, the treatment route that, that was basically a lot of SSRIs and a lot of other things. Uh, I didn't want that. And so naturally I turned to the one medication that was um, readily accessible and you know relatively inexpensive and societally okay, um, alcohol. I just drank lots of alcohol. If I would drink six or eight beers a night, that meant I didn't have any nightmares that night. That meant I had a better shot at a halfway decent, mildly hungover day the next day. Um, eventually I realized that was not sustainable. And so I began to ease into the path of my own personal healing regiment. Um, and it started, I think, if there's one thing looking back now that I realize about PTSD, about the long, or what for many of us has been a long road out um, and many don't get out, is that it's never one magic bullet that gets you from suffering immensely to rainbows and unicorns and life's great and I'm happy and all my friends are like, you know, I don't know. There's no direct, simple path. There are, th that said, there have been two or three things along the way that have done, that have been tools that have given me so much more uh, in, in the way of healing my own mind, healing my own psyche, and, and moving things forward, and we'll get to that. Um, I believe the first one was to, uh, I had started a another job as a construction worker, a lot of hard labor was what I was doing before I went into the army. Um, tried it again when I got out of the army and just kind of realized that it was breaking down my body. I was mentally already broken down and I didn't want to continue just getting broken. Um, so I let that job go. I found a friend who was a snowboard instructor who was like, well, it's winter time good luck finding a job in the winter, maybe just come out, become a snowboard instructor with me for the winter, find a real job in the springtime. Um, and that led to five years of being a snowboard bum. <laughs> Probably one of the best decisions of my life, <laughs> hands down. Uh, what did I, just, just to distill it as best I can quickly uh, for the sake of time, 
It gave me nature. I was out in nature, which is something I enjoyed, hiking. Uh, just seeing a sunrise from a mountaintop. Um, you know, being in the elements, uh, having the cold wind blow in your face, um, uh, be doing something physically active. Uh, so running has helped me a lot um, in, in years past. Um, uh, snowboarding, obviously, you're using your body. And then uh, flow state is, is the final thing that really kind of clicked for me. Years later, I read a book on it and I was like, oh, that's why I enjoyed it so much. When because I don't do anything half-ass, and uh, naturally I was chasing down the pros, like the pro snowboarders uh, in the first year or two, and I was like, I want to ride as good as you. Um, I would love to be pro. You know, I it didn't, didn't quite have what it took to be it, but I could, I could ride with them, I could hang with them. And when you're, you know, dropping down a pretty steep cliff and you're weaving between two trees and dropping off a 15 foot drop and making two more turns between two tight trees any move could be you're in the hospital or dead and that state of flow where you can only focus on the micro moment of making that turn the micro moment of sizing up that jump the micro moment of weaving between those two trees and then the elation of having survived all that and maybe looked good doing it <laughs> as I got better uh, and had your friends filming it, um, that, was, that was very uplifting. Uh, to supplement that, I became a whitewater raft guide in the summer times and um, same thing, outdoors, same thing. Whitewater rafting in class four, sometimes five rapids. There's a lot of decisions that need to be made. They all need to be made split second. They're forcing you into a state of flow. You're getting physical exercise from it. You're getting camaraderie. You're getting to work with a team. All these things filled up my heart. So slowly but surely over those five years, I cut back on drinking considerably, and that was huge. Um, but I was still angry at the shape of the world that I came back to. I was still depressed. Um, I actually read <laughs> a brief article on my way in here, uh, and it was basically um, kids who are left in cribs to cry, which is probably most of our generation, our parents and grandparents were told, you know, eight, nine o'clock, put them in there, let them cry. Um, turns out, if that's the way we were handling that situation, our parents were handling that situation, um, we are, 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 I have it on my phone. Basically, the part of our brain that is going to allow us to receive uh, happiness and joy and um, serotonin receptors, um, they don't get as big. They don't grow, they don't mature, and you're less likely to be able to hold joy. And uh, so that kind of helps me understand a little bit of my depression when I was younger. Um, and yet, I think one of, the, one of the things that science always says is that we're kind of like, you can't teach, not science, one of, one of the old wives' tales is you can't teach a new dog new, new tricks. Um, and I've never fully subscribed to that because I don't want to be stuck where I've been stuck mentally, so I just pretend that that's not the truth and that I can change, I can grow, I can heal, I can allow my brain to have more synapses, make new connections that will allow me joy and happiness. And as we get more into the psychedelics, um, I believe that that is um, in many ways happening. I know that for sure new connections are able, be, able to be made um, through a lot of the psychedelics. Um, so I'm gonna just consult my list, kind of bounce around here. Um, remind me, this is, uh, again, I, uh, am I supposed to talk for about an hour and then Q&A? Am I supposed to, what's, what's the norm? About an hour? Great. So about 30 more minutes. Um, appreciate that. Uh, so what are s some other things that helped in the healing process? Uh, and we'll jump into some psychedelic talk now. Um, dancing has always, uh, moving the body, dancing, feeling the bass. Um, just, yeah, dancing uh, has been hugely impactful in the healing process for me. Uh, very depressed growing up, very, uh, for sake of time, just depressed. Um, and di didn't have much fun 
or enjoyment out of life in the early years. And as soon as I was able to have a car and start driving around and having some freedoms, some joy got to come in. As soon as I started stumbling onto the dance scene around 17, 18, 19, um, a lot more joy started to come in. And uh, for someone who was depressed and someone who was seeking to self-medicate, um, I tried just about, well, not every, but quite a few, almost every drug um, that I could get my hands on on the street. And uh, weirdly, or not weirdly enough, the ones that I found to be my favorites um, were ecstasy uh, or MDMA, um, uh, LSD, and psilocybin mushrooms. All, every single one of them, uh, you know, ecstasy on the dance floor, um, knowing what I know now, wouldn't totally recommend that. But at the time, I was seeking to self-medicate and seeking to find happiness. And um, I believe what I've learned is, I mean, just moving the human body gets you in a different state and lets stuff that's been stuck move. So just the physicality of moving and dancing, uh, I can't sing that praise enough, with or without drugs. Um, most of the time, better without drugs, just to move your body, go for a run, get, get on the dance floor, do whatever it is that you do that makes you move, has been super helpful for me. Um, and, uh, but I was, an abuse, I was in an abusive chapter of my life where I was abusing myself and everything that I could get my hands on. And so doing ecstasy probably more frequently than I ought to was, um, you know, you, you deplete a part of your brain that takes a good week or so to kind of get your, your, your serotonin levels back up to some sort of status quo. Um, and uh, when you're doing ecstasy every weekend for months or years at a time, um, you never get a chance to physically recover. And so um, just a, a good wake up call and a watch out scenario for me. Uh, it's, it's good that we, as we start to embrace MDMA assisted therapy for PTSD, as soon as we start to embrace um, uh, you know, finding a guide to go on a psychedelic journey with, um, that it's, it's, it's what we learn while under the influence, while on a journey with a therapist, while um, in these uh, altered states of consciousness that, that um, they're calling it integration, where the long tail after the fact is where we integrate it, is where we put it into our lives, is where we sit with what we've learned, it's where we allow whatever good feelings that came up through maybe having taken one of these drugs or through the aha moments that happen um, you know, in, in the process. Y your body needs to be able to ingest it all, figure out what to do with it, and then move forward. Um, and so when I was in my party stage, I wasn't giving my, my, my body any chance to do anything but make it to the next weekend so I could get my hands on whatever I could get my hands on. Um, to the point where I pretty much swore off all drugs of any kind, um, probably from the age of like 25 all the way up until 35 or 36. And um, the next big chapter of healing for me, once I got the drinking under control, once I was, you know, exercising, once I was in flow state, once I was outdoors doing fun things. Um, uh, one of my snowboard buddies, uh, it's so funny, like, all snowboard dudes are just total, like, yeah, what's up, bro? And then when your yo, what's up, bro, says, I wanna go to yoga, you wanna come? Yoga, what's that? Uh, you know, South Lake Tahoe, um, small town. He drags me to this tiny little yoga place. There's like four of us in the room, and I go through an asana and uh, the, the whole thing, and I was like, yeah, I feel pretty good. This could, this could help our snowboarding. Uh, so that led to doing it, you know, once or twice a month, um, and then moved to Portland, and yoga's going off everywhere. And so um, started to be 
you know, once or twice a week. And then uh, for a, about a two year period, um, uh, a, a very, very close friend of mine was a yoga instructor and um, started going pretty much every day or at least five days a week or so. And holy crap, the amount of stuff that comes through just moving of the body in an intentional way, profound for me. Um, and then meditation came on the heels of that and um, started developing a meditation practice. Um, and at this point, I had done a lot of healing and yet I still wasn't connected to my emotions anymore. I still was cold. I still couldn't cry. I still wouldn't even barely well up to cry. Um, and after a yoga class and then a followed up by a meditation class, the meditation teacher read a poem by Thich Nhat Hanh that finally ripped me wide open. And I'm gonna read that poem to you now. Um, I believe the name of the poem is Call Me By My, Call Me By My True Name. Don't say that I will depart tomorrow. Even today I am still arriving. Look deeply. Every second and I am arriving to be a bud on a spring branch, to be a tiny bird with still fragile wings, learning to sing in my new nest, to be a caterpillar in the heart of a flower, to be a jewel hiding in itself in a stone. I still arrive in order to laugh and to cry, to fear and to hope. The rhythm of my heart is the birth and death of all that is alive. I am a mayfly metamorphosizing on the surface of the river. And I am the bird that swoops down and swallows the mayfly. I am the frog swimming happily in the clear water of a pond. And I am the grass snake that silently feeds itself on the frog. I am the child in Uganda, all skin and bones, my legs as thin as bamboo sticks. And I am the arms merchant selling deadly weapons to Uganda. I am the 12-year-old girl refugee on a small boat who throws herself into the ocean after being raped by a sea pirate. And I am also the pirate, my heart not yet capable of seeing and loving. I am a member of the Paltaboro with plenty of power in my hands. And I am the man who has to pay his debt of blood to my people dying slowly in a forced labor camp. My joy is like spring, so warm it makes flowers bloom all over the earth. My pain is like a river of tears, so vast it fills the four oceans. Please call me by my true names so I can hear all my cries and laughter at once, so I can see that my joy and pain are one. Please call me by my true names so I can wake up and the door of my heart could be left open, the door of compassion. And so for me, it was the bit of basically I am, you know, the small child and I am also the pirate who's doing the worst imaginable thing. Uh, any veteran who's been in a wartime situation, who has been forced to do things that seem completely against every part of their compassionate self, um, and then come back with the struggle of not knowing what to do with this feeling of bad, sick, and wrong, and evil, uh, the self-hatred is immeasurable and the confusion and the, I, well, even if I could feel good, I probably shouldn't. Um, to hear Thich Nhat Hanh kind of speak to that in such a non-judgmental way and 
and just to see every aspect of our, of our life from the times where we were helping someone and the times where we were actively hurting someone that we love quite often. Um, yeah, it broke me open. I cried for the first time in, since I could remember. And, and then for the next three or four weeks, I was crying two, three times a day in the best way. Uh, it was a purge like no other. And um, I don't cry nearly as often as I'd like to these days. I think it would be, it would be awesome if I could, you know, at least, at least once or twice a week get there. But um, uh, that said, let's kind of jump forward to, um, so a lot of healing has already happened and I've picked up a lot of tools along the way. Uh, being outdoors in nature, hiking, physical activity, getting into states of flow, um, uh, the, the community and camaraderie that comes with paddling down the river with people, uh, the, the stillness and the non-judgmental awareness state that comes from meditation, the release of feelings in the body for me as I would do my yoga practice. Um, and yet, there's, we're multifaceted and depression was still uh, lingering and you know I won't lie I'm not out of the woods yet it still creeps up it still lingers um, but some of the tools that I've slowly returned to um, it started off with take uh, mushrooms psilocybin taking normal what I'm you know I'm not the I'm not the guy to tell you how many micrograms of anything uh, nor nor am I gonna have that talk right now but um, whatever your normal run-of-the-mill um, dose of mushrooms is, uh, I figured that out and I took that three or four times about a month or two apart each by myself in a room with no one else and just kind of sat with my emotions, sat with my feelings and started to feel joy again, started to feel connected in a world where I felt disconnected started to, you know, laugh. Uh, and that was, in a sense, the, re the beginning of reprogramming my brain to not only see what's wrong with the world, not only see what's wrong with my own personal situation. And, um, and then I wouldn't say I went all the way down to microdose, but then I started to, for the next two months or so, like twice a month, take a half or a third of a, do of a normal dose of mushrooms and kind of felt what that felt like in my body as like a, a touchstone of, yes, I can, I can touch and feel on what that joy feels like. Um, and then, I, and then I, that was that for a while. Um, naturally, as uh, a curious person, as a filmmaker, as someone who is interested in learning about what the heck is going on with any single one of us at any given moment, I wanted to know more. So as I started delving into the, you know, the Portland Psychedelic Society um, and seeking out information, talking with friends about it, uh, extensive Google searches, reading books, uh, I started to hear more and more things about MDMA-assisted therapy for PTSD. And that's what led me, I mean, okay, so plain and simple, when I got out of the military, I had PTSD, it was gnarly, it took me about five years to not have the worst kind of dreams that would not let you rest, and it was just way too much alcohol to even, I don't even want to think about how much alcohol I drank at that time, and then it was a long process of everything I already just discussed. And even then, just now, starting to deal with the depression aspect of it, I never quite felt like when I would be around other veterans and hear and know how much each one of us is suffering, I never felt like there was any good, clear path out of PTSD. Um, and so I kind of just felt hopeless and helpless and remove myself from the veteran community, remove myself from having to even face the fact that most of us probably aren't gonna make it out alive. 
Uh, best case scenario, we suffer off and on through the rest of our life and, and have a few moments of joy, but most of it's gonna be rough. You know, obviously worst case scenario, um, somewhere around 22 of us uh, every single day commit suicide. So, um, I mean, that's, that's pretty staggering if you think about it. Uh, and so there was always this no hope mentality around it and I just tried to avoid it at all costs. Um, and then when the MDMA assisted therapy research was, was hitting numbers, uh, you know, the numbers are always slightly moving because the more research you get, the more people that have been involved, the numbers are gonna move around a little bit. But, you know, something like 67% of people coming out of phase two trials, PTSD free, uh, with only three sessions of MDMA over the course of, what's the normal course, Alyssa? Four months. Holy shit, four months to have a good chunk of what took me seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years to unfuck myself. Uh, okay, there's hope, finally. And I would also say that I don't see this as the go get MDMA assisted therapy and you're out of the woods and you're up to where I'm at. Uh, I think like anything we need a well-rounded, balanced lifestyle, a healthy diet's good, exercise is good, you know, talking with, hanging out with friends is good. Um, develop, be developing other practices along the way, and when it comes time to take uh, the, the measure of, of, of seeking out MDMA-assisted therapy, uh, how exciting is it that we're, we're clearing phase three trials and this will be available to people, you know, hopefully in the next year or two. Um, and we can do a four month, what took me seven or eight years, and then they can start picking up all these other tools and finding a life that doesn't suck and isn't looking down the barrel of suicide. And so I have now started to step back into the um, veteran community. Um, and let's, I'm just gonna refer to my notes for one more quick thing, then we'll wrap it up and jump into some questions. Um, there might've been one more cool thing to talk about before we get there. Yeah, I guess the final thing I'll talk about in case we wanna talk about it in the questions. Uh, the final thing I wanna talk about is, um, on my own, through my own extensive research, uh, this, is, this is always the touchy, the, the, the touchy thing, because a, a lot of these substances we're still talking about are still illegal in the state that we're in. And uh, so I'm not saying go do this right now. Um, but what I am saying is for me in my own personal journey and experimentation, um, I got a lot of really interesting feedback around microdosing either um, psilocybin mushrooms or, or um, LSD. And so I put myself on a, about a four month regiment um, where I would take a 10th of a hit of acid every third day for those four months and just kind of journaled and paid attention to how I was doing overall. And um, I found that overall, my, I, I guess I'm, I was grateful for all of the bigger psychedelic experiences I've had throughout either my youth and or up until recently that have given me a more heart open, a more interconnected feeling and view of, a, of the world, a, le a less, um, dog eat dog world, aggressive, you know, you got to just fight for everything, mental state and a, we can do this together. There are many of us that are suffering. There are many of us that are out there trying to help heal themselves and the people around them um, and to reshift focus. And so um, I guess the biggest takeaway from, from microdosing LSD over those four months is two things happened. One, um, I, I continually kind of reset back to a, a more positive outlook on life, a more 
oh wow, that tree looks extra beautiful today as I'm walking past it. Um, and I'm more open to connecting with a friend. I'm more close to the emotions of my tears coming up inside of me and then letting those tears go and, and feeling the release that comes with that. And then uh, the beauty of so many of these, uh, uh, well, well, let's just say uh, LSD, is um, it is such a non-addictive sort of drug that um, ask anyone who has had a really big LSD experience and they're good for a while. They're good for a long while. They're not looking to do that anytime soon. And, uh, and I would say, you know, um, even on the microdose level, after, I think I was aiming for four months, after three months, I noticed that when I would hit my third day, when I would take it, when it was time to take it again, I would wake up and my brain had already made new pathways that said, huh, I already feel like I'm having a slightly better day and a little bit less edge on the situation and I'm a little bit happier. Maybe I just won't take it today and I'll just kind of pay attention over the next few days. And so um, from going from every third day, I started going you know, only once or twice a, a week to once, um, uh, once a week, once a month. And before, and I wasn't even like trying to do or not do anything. I was just paying attention to how I was feeling and when I didn't feel like I needed anything, or I didn't feel like I needed to touch back and keep the regiment going, because I was already feeling like I was feeling the, the positive outcome of, of a little bit of microdosing, um, it just kind of started to fade away. And um, only, only once in a while now uh, do I even take just that microdose, that tenth of a hit to kind of like touchstone back to, yep, I can feel good. Yep, I can feel happy. Uh, yep, those, those feelings are within reach. Um, and so naturally, as um, MDMA leads the way, psilocybin, hopefully shortly thereafter, will be legalized for the therapeutic use um, in, in so many different scenarios. And then, you know, one day we'll be able to, to talk about the big, bad, scary LSD and maybe reintroduce that in a very healthy way. Um, uh, but that said, I think the final thing I'll say before we open up to questions is none of these things, including yoga, including exercise, including flow state, were the golden ticket that got me where I am today or completely out of the woods. It was a holistic combined effort and a lot of it just, you know, had to do with waking up to all the garbage that I'm eating every day. and and figuring out what a healthy diet was and then putting healthy stuff into myself. And so um, I look at psychedelics and anything else that we could do in a very similar light. Um, stay curious, um, you know, don't just go try things willy nilly and, um, and get educated. And I think that's the whole point of these talks is to hear people's stories, um, where they've been, why they have chosen to take psychedelics in any, any state uh, for healing or for um, getting in a better headspace. So, whew. All right. <laughs> so if, I guess for the sake of questions, do you want to jump in here and help me? Yeah, totally. What, what's so, the best way to go about this? So what we'll do is uh, if you just raise your hand uh, after Ian finishes answering every question, um, Ian can just point to the crowd as questions arise and answer them as you will. Sounds good. And I'll repeat. Next to your microphone today. We, don't have we do not. OK. Yeah. Um, I mean, we could, I could just do the whole run around the audience and throw a microphone <laughs> in people's face thing like I'm a TV show host. I can do that. You can do that. All right, sweet. It's a small enough audience. So. Small enough audience. <laughs> right, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, who's, got, who's got a question? Let's jump right in. Dave. <laughs> I seated it so the first one would be easy. No, I have no idea what he was going to say. Um, can you say some of the specific things that either taking MDMA therapeutically or LSD therapeutically unlocked for your brain and your heart? Yeah. Thank you. Um, unlocked for my brain and my heart. Uh, LSD probably unlocked the curious nature that I already had when I was a kid that somehow society squashed out of me and I'm slowly bringing it back. So the, just the, 
the curiousness of a friendship and what that can bring to me, the curiousness of walking in nature and not just being in my head going rah, 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 but like, oh wow, look at that tree, oh wow, look at that bird, oh wow, look at that stream trickling by. Just the awe of what an incredible, magical world we get to live in. I mean, why do we all get hooked on cat videos? Like, a cat having a very present moment and being a complete goofball is, there's something magical to it. And when we allow ourselves to have that cat mind, that curiosity, that awe and wonder, that like, holy shit, that just smacked me in the face, like, blah, 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 moment, like it snaps us out of our negative rah, 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 thoughts. So LSD, I would say, did that. And then um, I guess to, to kind of uh, give a little bit of context, um, I, went out of state and found um, someone who could uh, facilitate an underground MDMA session with me and just so I could feel and understand what the people in my documentary are gonna be going through. And guess what, I still got stuff to heal. And, and most of my healing through that wasn't around the trauma of war, but around the trauma of being bullied actually, um, not only in the military uh, before we went to war, um, but just some key elements of my past of being bullied and somehow writing that all off as like, I convinced myself I've never been bullied. I, I hear stories of kids in school being bullied and I'm like, well, that's so glad that never happened to me. Um, but I had completely covered all that up. So it kind of opened up the realization the fact that A, I had been bullied, B, it's not my fault. C, now that I kind of know about it, I can start healing some of that stuff and, and, and seeking how are other people who have been bullied finding healing, you know? And so outside of the MDMA, at, long after the fact, without having to return to the MDMA over and over and over to find like that feeling of I'm okay, um, it, it gave me new information and a new path to go down to be curious about how are other people healing from being bullied? So I guess, uh, in short, there were so many other things that come up uh, in, the, in a session like that, but those were the big ones. All right, who's next? All right, right there. So I'm just a little bit curious about your um, path of creativity and filmmaking and the healing process and how those two things kind of dovetail together. Yay, you're gonna get an extra big round of applause when we're done here. Okay, um, yes, creativity, filmmaking. Uh, holy cow, so I, I was always chock full of ambition and yet living a very sheltered upbringing, I didn't have many options at my disposal and I was, I, the, the thing I agonized over most was, I wanna do something awesome with my life, I don't know what I wanna do with my life though, I don't I have no clue but I know I want it to be awesome, and it's gonna be awesome, and I'm gonna have lots of fun doing it, but I have no freaking clue what it is. And I look at my three options in, in the town I grew up in, like I could be a carpenter like my dad, I could go be a gas station attendant, which is my first job, pumping gas, uh, or I could go be a carpenter like my dad. Uh, I just didn't have many role models in my life to show me much anything else. So uh, finding, snowboarding and then finding a camera in one of my friend's hands and then finding a Macintosh computer where we could edit said footage together. Ding! Everything went click. I'm like, yep, that's what I'm gonna do with the rest of my life. Never look back. And so the joy of creating shots, creating moments, capturing moments through a camera is one of my favorite things in the world. And that led me to uh, directing films, which led me to, okay, how the heck do you talk to actors? Let's take acting classes to figure that out, which led me to, whoa, what deep connections can come through having to be an emotionally vulnerable situation with another fellow human being in made-up circumstances. Everyone thinks, oh, you know, you're just playing make-believe as an actor and, you, you know, you're, you're faking it. And it's like, no, we're faking it every day in life. We're, pre we're going in and pretending like we don't hate our boss's guts. We're you know, pretending that it's, it's cool that we haven't sorted out this relationship problem that you and your partner might be having. 
And we, we put on that fake smile, but when you're in an acting class and you have a teacher who's there going, bullshit, that's, you're not telling the truth, you're not telling the truth, and then you finally get to the vulnerability of it, and then one of the actors bursts into tears, and the other one's heart breaks for him, and then suddenly the scene works. And so it's that raw, vulnerable honesty. Um, that said, that all led me to, into uh, becoming a better uh, asker of questions and sit down interviews and the creativity of just shutting up and listening to someone else talk, uh, asking a good question and getting the hell out of the way and just letting it flow. Um, the connection that comes through there is so profound. I feel like if we genuinely got to hear every single person in this room's story from start to finish, and you only heard like a snippet of my story, story but uh, if we got to hear a, just all of it, there's no way we couldn't help but fall in love with that person and just feel compassion and empathy towards them 100%. I just, I guarantee it. Um, and so that the creative process of, of doing what clicks in my brain to make sense of filmmaking and sitting down and listening to people have both been hugely uh, impactful in making my heart open up a little bit more every day. Uh, great question. What do we got next? Yes. Thank you. Woo! Woo! Kick flip. Uh, how did uh, psychedelics open up your heart and shut down the internal rooftop chatter obsession that grew to a girl that you talk about? Um. Uh, they're called magic mushrooms for a reason. <laughs> there is some magic in there. Um, I don't know that I can answer the how. Um, I think there are plenty of scientists out there who are working daily to figure out the how. But for me personally, um, what was the shift? Uh, I think it just, I, I am inherently a curious person, but um, it, so let's just say in, in psilocybin um, and in LSD, it opens up the curious mind again to the awe of everything around you. And you're just like, whoa. I mean, this sounds, I don't care how it sounds. Feeling the texture of this crappy, disgusting, beat up, <laughs> like I can give so many negative judgments to this and yet if even, I could probably even be microdosing LSD and just feel the texture there and suddenly like, I'm in the present moment having a moment with the texture and I just feel a flood of bliss and joy wave over me. What's going on there? Oh, but I'm in the present moment and not in my head. So it, it kind of redirects and allows the curiosity to come up and then allows little things like a, a texture to like blow your freaking mind. Um, and then I know MDMA um, shrinks the amygdala. Help me out, Alyssa. What, what happens? Reduces activity in the amygdala, which is the fear-based center in the brain, which then allows you to not be in ah state and get into, yet again, the curious state. And the I'm safe enough to walk through these very traumatic things, events of my life and, um, and process them in a way that they can basically be compartmentalized into a memory and then shelved as a memory as opposed to something that's never been processed all the way through and is just on repeat trying to figure out what the, what the heck went wrong there? I need to fix this. What the heck went wrong there? I need to fix this. What the heck went wrong there? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What the, what's wrong? What was wrong? Like, it, you get a chance to pipe, complete it and hopefully file it away and, and, um, and just get out of your own way. So I think that's the short answer of, of that question. It's, it's very in-depth. Uh, another question. Yes. So uh, my personal experience is limited to marijuana um, uh, for various reasons. But um, I stopped using marijuana in my 20s because 
street drugs, um, you never knew exactly what you were getting and every experience was different and it was unpredictable and of course over the years marijuana got stronger and stronger and uh, it became even more unpredictable and sometimes, you know, caused paranoia and all of that. So once marijuana became legal again, or legal, I started using it again uh, for various reasons and it, it, you know, it's been helpful in certain circumstances. But the thing is, I know exactly how many, you know, how much THC and how much CBD and how much all of the, you know, it's all very regulated because it's legal. Um, and I've heard studies with, you know, microdosing psilocybin and all of that and the benefits of it. But my question and my concern is, as long as it remains illegal, how do you know what you're getting? How do you know what it's cut with? How do you know how strong it is? How do you know that the experience is going to be the same every time and you're not going to have some freak out weird trip because you're buying illegal street drugs? Uh, I think the short answer is, is uh, there is benefit to waiting for these things to become legalized and don't just go buy things off the street all willy nilly. Um, I do know that there are tester kits, especially for MDMA, where you can test and it'll tell you what's in it. And um, they're, they're totally 100% legal to get them. I think you can get them on Amazon. Uh, and they're cheap too, I'm pretty sure. Um, Dance Safe, dancesafe.com has, has everything you need uh, to, to, if you are gonna, you know, go ahead and experiment on your own. Um, again, I'm not here to tell anyone to do that, uh, but there are safer ways to do that, to test what you're getting off the street, to know um, what's in it, and uh, if, it's, if it's bad news, it'll come up that way and tell you uh, through the test, and then just don't do it. Um, yes, please, if you want to expound more on that, this is not my strength. Yeah, I just wanted to also say, uh, especially pertaining to psilocybin, uh, Portland Psychedelic Society hosts monthly workshops that help you learn how to grow your own at home. Makes for pretty easy experimentation, and also you don't have to deal with the, the you know, sketchy dealing aspect of it, not knowing that too. where it's coming from and all that. Also, you live in Oregon, so exactly. it's pretty good to Yep. Cool. Yeah. And if I could ask the next question. Please, too. fire away. Um, so, as far as explaining um, the DNA trials to fellow veterans, maybe some veterans that don't have as open of a mind that you already had towards these types of substances, what is kind of your method to, um, you know, remain neutral and kind of ease into, you know, or just kind of pass their walls of defense, you know, to make them kind of see the potential in it without trying to, you know, convince them too hard. Yeah. So the, the question was specific to veterans, right? When talking to, to veterans? veterans? Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I, would, I would hope to, to learn something from your answer to be able to explain it to more uh, closed-minded, conservative people in my life. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, um, yeah uh, from my experience, uh, especially in the veteran community, um, I, I, I think with the exception of a couple um, of, of, of my friends that I've talked to, most of us have been through enough stuff and had enough dead-end roads that in one way or another we're willing to try anything and so um, that said uh, I would always point everyone towards um, getting signed up for you know uh, as, as phase three trials is wrapping up and as expanded access becomes available um, get on a list now sooner than later so that um, when it comes time where we can, they can take on the mega load of, of people that need this and are, are signing up for it, they'll be in there to get the best possible um, experience with trained professionals in a very regimented, proven to help, you know, 60 some percent. Uh, and and, every, and of, the, of the 60 some percent that, that were PTSD free, um, pretty much everybody else had a significant, some sort of lowering of symptoms. So that's freaking awesome too. So um, I point to the science, I point to the people who are forging ahead and who have been um, 
doing this either work to get it legalized for the past 30 or 40 years. Uh, MAPS is a great resource for that. Um, and then I also, um, I mean, there's plenty of people who have been doing this work underground who have started writing books and doing talks on it. And you know, even Michael Pollan wrote a book on it and that's, that's circulating. So um, I would, s if, if I'm sharing this with anyone and uh, I would also, it's not just, it's not for everybody. And I, I think under, talking to someone who understands the full range of psychedelics and the possible experiences you could have with each and every one of them, and then talking with them about your specific struggles with whatever you're dealing with, um, they can help better point you in the direction of, uh, you know, maybe you should seek out MDMA therapy to take on this big monster. Maybe you could start microdosing mushrooms to take on this subtle lingering depression. Maybe you could take on, you know, just the, the, re, the, the people with the information are out there. It's available. Um, uh, Cross-referencing off of, off of people like the Psychedelic Society who are steeped in it can really point you in good directions. Um, I'm sure, you know, even emailing, does the Psychedelic Society kind of field emails from time to time? In that, yeah, so um, there are people out there who have the information who are willing to share it with you. Uh, so do your own research and seek out people who have done their research way more than you, and you'll be way better off than just stumbling around the dark trying to figure this out yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks. Uh. Thank you very much. Your presentation of what you talked about and your experiences kind of put in a nutshell over a long period of time what happens and how we make these transitions from the lives we led to what we're leading now. Uh, as I'm sitting here listening, I know that there's a lot of people that are going to be seeing this kind of information presented to them brand new for the first time. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a lot of people who come from the kinds of backgrounds to where ingesting psychedelic substances is not in their wheelhouse, if you'll pardon the expression. Mm. I was wondering if there was three things that you could suggest people do to like kind of deal with PTSD and other these other conditions that tend to be debilitating without the use of ethnogens mm. while the processes, like a lot of people are going to need help immediately and they're not going to be able to sign up for a study mm -hmm. or they're not even going to be able to meet somebody who can even speak about their experiences. I was wondering if you could list three things really quickly that people can do uh, to help themselves through this transitionary process. And the last thing you spoke about was where they talked about their things to other people. If you could make that like one of them and just like the three non ethnogenic ways that people can kind of help themselves before they engage with ethnogens mm. or uh, MDA, M MDMA assisted uh, therapies. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to kind of put a pin in one thing that is um, talking to people who this just isn't in their wheelhouse. I want to come back and touch on that in a second. Um, but yes, three. Uh, best advice, go do physical activity uh, that's going to make you sweat and make you get out of your comfort zone and make you get out of your head and into your body. Um, and even if you're, you know, blown up so bad that you're in a wheelchair, there's got to be something somewhere that you're team knows to do to get you moving your body in a way that's going to start letting you physically let go of some of that crud. So find a way to move your body and try to do it regularly. Um, you know, the, a lot of therapists say do it every single day and I always laugh and I'm like, yeah, you don't know my life, how busy I am. Um, and yet, man, every day is key. But uh, that's a cool ringtone right there. 
<laughs> is that a child? Um, laughter, that, I guess that would be another good one. Uh, I find that if I'm in a state of not healthy mental well-being, uh, for instance, traffic. I'm stuck in traffic. I don't like stuck being stuck in traffic. I orchestrate my life in a way where I almost never get stuck in traffic. So when it happens, I'm really mad at myself for even allowing it to happen in the first place. And, uh, and, and we're in Portland and traffic's getting worse. And you know what? So be it. It is what it is. People, people think it's cool here. I thought it was cool here 10 years ago. Here we all are. So you're stuck in traffic anyways and you're freaking pissed. Uh, turn on some comedy, whatever your flavor is. Stand-up comedy does it for me. Um, and just put yourself in a situation where you'll be laughing a lot. Um, uh, Alan Watts had, at one point, a, a laughing meditation where he would just stand up and he would fake laugh until it was so ridiculous that you, he would actually laugh. And then that laughter would get even bigger. And if you're doing it with a friend or your partner, one of you is going to crack the other one up in a matter of seconds to the point where you're just like, what? If anyone were to drive by right now and take a look in, they'd be like, whew, lock them up. <laughs> um, and you would not believe the dopamine hit that you get and the release. So laughter would be another good one. Find, put yourself in a situation that you know is going to make you laugh. Find that person. My brother does it to me. He makes me laugh no matter what. We have the same sense of humor. Um, we grew up in the same crazy way and we both get each other. So, um, and then, yeah, I guess that would segue into find somebody that you connect with and actually connect with them. Like, you can even get straight to it and say, okay, we talked about the weather. Okay, we bitched about politics. Now can we just, like, talk about some, like, I'm feeling not okay today about X, Y, or Z. Can I, can I vent to you for a minute? Or... Uh, let's go do something together that will get ourselves out of the headspace of just being, you know, even there sitting on the couch venting all the time. Uh, whatever your way of connecting with another human being is, I find it's really helpful for me to connect with other human beings. Or, or even when the idea of connecting or being around other human beings is traumatizing to me at times where I just don't wanna because of my time in the service and time being surrounded by way too many of, I won't even call them the enemy because they're just guys like me who were in a place they didn't want to be trying not to get dead just like I was. Um, but the opposing side trying to kill me uh, and or just feeling the energy of too many people in one place and that was too much for me. Um, so sometimes even the idea of being with one other person is kind of scary. But I think we all probably know at least one person in our life who we can be real with. Um, luckily, most of us have that. Uh, and if you don't, I would say do everything when you're not in a triggered state to go out and make that happen. Find that person. They're out there. Fellow veterans who've been through it, there are so many of us who are willing to sit down with you and have that talk. It just have that listen, I should say. And, and the, the friendship kind of snowballs from that. So awesome question. And then back to my pin, I would say, um, luckily, the communities that are often resistant to the idea of a psychedelic are often the ones that are the most behind the veteran community and the most caring about their young boys and girls and anyone coming back who is suffering greatly and um, just point them towards things like the FDA is now not only approving MDMA-assisted therapy, they're calling it a breakthrough uh, drug. And so, holy shit, like, not, it's, it's about to be very legal in, in a very safe way and, and very destigmatized. So um, find stuff like that. It's, it's a bit of a gateway into the, the potential for other psychedelics being less scary in the future. Point to the science. Yeah, right there. Thank you again. Oh, hi. On that last MDMA trip that you took, um, when you said you had experience realizing that you were bullied as a child, uh, just not too personal, like, what did that feel like in your body and your emotions during that trip that made you realize later that that had happened? Um. Uh, 
it's kind of hard to put your finger on exactly what clicks, but it was, I guess it was a free association of information that was one, uh, there was a sergeant in my platoon who wanted to go be special forces and needed someone to be on that mission with him. And I inadvertently pissed him off and he was like, cool, I'm gonna whip the shit out of you. We're both put on a rucksack, going on a 12 mile ruck march till midnight. I'm gonna wake you up and run you 10 miles tomorrow morning when you inevitably fall out because your legs are gonna fall off. I'm gonna make you run the hill seven more times just to like break you. And that went on for a very long time. And uh, he physically and mentally bullied me way beyond anything I experienced in basic training. Uh, and basic training, I thoroughly enjoyed. The, the breakdown, build, you back up process, uh, even though it was hard. Um, I, th I felt there was a time and the place to do such a thing. Uh, but when I was continued to be bullied to a degree that didn't quite make sense uh, after the fact, um, I kind of saw that at the time I thought it was just you know more of the same old bullshit. But looking back, I realized that that was not the case and that I was actually bullied. Um, and um, and then that kind of led me, because I, I guess I was blind to the fact that I was bullied. I didn't ever feel like I was bullied. So when I got that first hit of realization, like, oh, wow, I was bullied, then I started going backwards in time and asking myself, well, where, that, where else was I bullied? And then you kind of... Um, in it, it's, it's so interesting because it wasn't, it's not the bullying in the, in the stereotypical way that you would think, um, but inadvertently, my mom, through her expectations of what she wanted from me and how she went about getting those results, was a very subtle form of bullying. And um, it was very passive aggressive in a lot of ways, and in other ways it was, it was actually aggressive. Um, but I guess I don't wanna you know, just sit here and bully my mom back for having bullied me. Um, but I was awakened to the idea that um, her belief systems and her uh, struggling through her own trauma that was in many ways resolved and in many ways was still unresolved. Um, stuff rolls downhill, you know? It's generational stuff is, we're not, it's not anything new to us. We kind of know that it rolls downhill. And if someone can stop the, if someone can be the person who finds, you know, she healed herself to a certain point. My dad also had some stuff. He healed himself to a certain point. He never received a moment or a, an I love you from his father, a hug from his father, an attaboy from his father. He got nothing his entire life. So my dad said, I'm gonna be the end of that and I'm gonna tell my boys I love them every single day. I'm gonna kiss them on the forehead until they finally tell me, Dad, stop, that's gross. Like, you know, 10, uh, leave me alone. But he still would continually tell me he loved me. Um, and so he broke that cycle. My mom broke other cycles even though she un unwittingly perpetuated others. Um, and so I can now see the importance of every single one of us who has had a trauma in our life, which is probably most of us, finding the things in life that can help us to heal so that we don't perpetuate them to our kids, our lovers, our loved ones, our friends. Um, it's really cool that we get the opportunity to heal and be the one that stops it from rolling on. Um, and then I guess I, I would also wanna pin on there it's super important that we're not beating ourselves up for past failures of seeing how we've done awful things to other people through our own messed up psychological systems and that we also forgive and love our parents and any other perpetrators of violence along the way because they were probably doing the best with what they got. So kind of forgiving yourself, forgiving the past and hoping for a better future through seeking healing through whatever means you're doing it. And psychedelics just happen to be one of them. Awesome, do we have time for a couple more, one more? No. Sure How are you guys feeling? What do we got, what do we got? Unless, unless you don't, then we're good. Sweet. All right, thank you so much.
And, uh, thank you so much for uh, for coming, everyone. Uh, I hope you uh, learned some valuable things the same way that I did tonight. Uh, thank you so much, Ian. It's a pleasure having you here, and uh, yeah, uh, it's an honor at the organization. So thank you, everyone. Uh, I would just like to say a few things of some. Uh, meetings we have coming up soon here uh, the Portland Psychedelic Society. Um, this Saturday is our mushroom workshop. Um, next Thursday, uh, November 21st, is the Portland Psychedelic Society Men's Support Group. And the following Sunday, November 24th, is the Psychedelic Elders Gathering. And that is all. And uh, so we got a book club as well. Yeah, the perception. Yeah. The, the woman's thing? The women's is, is hopefully um, coming together. We're waiting for people. Yeah. If you'd like to host, we're mainly looking for a host. There Someone, you go. please, <laughs> seriously. But, uh, I mean, yeah, uh, if, if you feel the need to, to volunteer with the organization and you feel the call, uh, please help us out because we're looking for volunteers and for people to help out uh, all the time. It's a nonprofit organization. No one's paid. It's a labor of love. That's for sure. Okay. So please, yeah, uh, talk to us uh, soon. Um, like I said, we're grinding a little bit early here, so there's more than enough time to uh, network with, with your fellow society members and support each other and uh, get to know each other, you know, right. make new relationships and, and all that. New connections, thank you. Absolutely. So thanks, thanks everyone for coming. It was a great night. And uh, hope to see you soon in the next couple of months. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah.